do you hold a medieval or ancient world shield? Or more importantly, how do you not hold it? Hi folks, Matt Eason here, Scholar Gladiatorian. Now last night I was playing Bannerlord, as I often do, and yet again I was annoyed by one simple fact, and that is in Bannerlord, and it has to be said in lots of other video games, and even in some movies and film and TV choreography fights, um, people do all sorts of wrong things with their shields. Now, I am not saying that there is always only one right way of holding a shield, and we're going to look at some different types of shields here, everything from Roman through different types of medieval shield, um, even from different uh, continents, and we're going to look at some different shields and how they are usually held, but also there's variations within them. Sometimes there's more than one way you can hold it. But what was the thing in the game that really annoyed me? That was someone was holding a sword, I'll just pick up a random sword here, right, here's a sword, and uh, there's this thing whereby people, when they strike with the weapon, they pull the shield behind them like this, and this is super Super annoying. Now, I'm not saying that nobody ever did this in history. I'm sure some noobs did do it in history and died as a result. But fundamentally, a shield is supposed to be protecting you, okay? So if your opponent is there, if you're my opponent, and I'm here with my sword and my shield, as I go to strike with it, I might have to move the shield slightly to get it out of the way. Uh, and sometimes I might cover the line to the hand with uh, my shield. We'll talk about that in a second. But what I absolutely don't want to do as I hit at you is do this. Okay, it's super, super annoying, and it happens so often in video games, so often in uh, movies and TV and stuff. So, absolutely, in order to use the weapon, it is nonsensical moving the shield completely out of the way as you strike almost all the time. There might be rare exceptions. One exception might be that if I've got one opponent there, one opponent there, and I sense that this person is launching an attack and you are launching an attack, so I've got two attacks coming at the same time, I might possibly choose to cover one while striking into the other person's hand or arm, taking them out of action so I can now come around and deal with this person. But by and large, your weapon, sorry, your shield, wants to stay in front of you, or at least protecting you, relative to where the threat is. There is also another exception as well, and that is particularly shown, uh, or particularly exemplified, in the Bolognese sauces, uh, which go well with spaghetti, incidentally. The sauces, the treatises from Bologna, like Morozzo, for example, whereby you're using a shield and a sword, and you're attacking at someone's leg. Now, one of the dangers of attacking down at someone's leg, always, is you leave your upper regions exposed, so to speak, rather than your nether regions. Um, so, generally speaking, if you're attacking up in the high lines up here, you are, while you're attacking the opponent, you're also covering your vitals above your stomach, because your weapon's in front of you. Your weapon naturally performs, uh, prescribes a cross of steel in front of your body, which has a defensive purpose at the same time as being offensive. But um, if you have a shield and you want to attack at someone's uh, leg, okay, there is a way whereby you can cover the high line because a natural response if someone attacks your leg is to move the leg back and hit them in the head or arm as they attack your leg. But the beauty of having a shield here is that you're able to cover the high line while attacking down at the leg in the same tempo. So there are some exceptions. But when we come to how do you hold a shield, Apart from just generally saying in front of you, which I suppose is generally true, there are actually some different ways of holding a shield. Now, most shields in history split down into two primary types, which we've covered in previous videos. They are the strap shield. These are sometimes referred to as N arms, but we can just call them straps, whereby your arm, a forearm usually, is strapped to the shield, okay? And lots of uh, medieval shields, later medieval shields particularly, um, are of this type. And this type first comes into use in uh, medieval Europe in the Norman era with this type of characteristic teardrop shield here, as seen on the Bayer Tapestry and other Norman um, sources and was used in the First Crusade, for example. So this type of shield was the first generation, we could say, in the late, uh, well, we could say basically after 1000 AD. Yeah, they probably appeared actually in the late 900s, but after 1000 AD, this became the predominant way of holding shields, certainly in Europe anyway, if not, uh, not necessarily in the world. But how did people hold shields before that? Well, it's the other type, and that is boss grip. Now, if we look at the ancient world, 
certainly if we look at Celtic shields, Germanic shields, going all the way through into the early medieval period, the migration era and later on the Viking era, Boscript shields predominate. And indeed, the Roman shield, the scutum, is also Boscript, you'll notice here. But an important thing to note, note about the Roman shield is that while it is boss script, it's horizontally boss script. Now, you could say, you could argue, in fact, that the um, earlier shields are not necessarily vertically gripped because, of course, you can rotate them. So you could hold them either way. So they could be horizontal or any, deg any 360 degrees, basically. So anywhere from vertical to horizontal. Um, that's true. However, um, it is notable that if we look at a lot of boss script shields, where the shield isn't circular, where it's oval or uh, Celtic shields and stuff like this, they are very often uh, horizontally gripped rather than, uh, sorry, vertically gripped rather than horizontally gripped. Not all of them. Some of them are horizontally gripped like Roman shields are, the scutum. Um, but it is worth mentioning anyway that sometimes handles run that way, sometimes that way. But fundamentally, most shields in history split into these two types, either strapped or boss gripped. The only shields really that kind of um, kind of cover those two together, if I just pull one off the wall here, you've seen this hang on the wall for many, many videos, are uh, Indian and Indo-Persian dull, and they actually have straps. Now, originally, the larger versions of these, you actually do put your hand through one strap and grip the second strap. Those are larger versions of more like this size, and this is a Rotella. We'll come back to the Rotella in a minute. However, when they become small, you actually grip them as boss gripped. So even though they've got straps, they are gripped in the same way as a boss gripped shield. So these kind of cover both aspects. They are strapped, but you hold them like a boss gripped shield. Now, how do you hold the shield? So you've got a few options here. Let's just pick up the Viking era shield as an example. So you've got how far do you hold it away from the body and what angle do you hold it at and what positions do you hold it at? So various options. Extreme option, you could hold the shield far away from the body, or you could hold it back here, or you could hold it here. Okay, so you could hold it really next to the body, a little bit out, or all the way out. Now, strengths and weaknesses. By holding it all the way out, that actually gives you the greatest degree of protection. The further away your arm is, imagine a cone, the lines that go around uh, a, a, an object, like um, shining a shadow on the wall, that actually gives you a larger cone of defense than holding it here. So if I hold the shield here, while it might protect this part of my body very, very well, my head is clearly above it, my legs are clearly below it. By holding it out here, the origin of movement of a sword or spear coming at me, now it is more difficult to get to my head and more difficult to get to my legs. So by holding the shield further away, it actually gives me greater protection. This would also go for missiles as well. It gives me a greater cone of defense from thrown spears and arrows being shot at me. Okay, so that's the first thing, um, distance. But contrary to just what is best defensively, you've got to think about how long can you hold it out there? <laughs> so shields, this is actually a relatively light shield, but some shields, for example, the Roman shield or the Norman shield get quite heavy. And if we look at something like a pavis from the 15th or 16th century, they can get really, really heavy, and you just can't hold them out at full arm's length. Some of them you can't do it at all, or you might be able to do it for like one rep, but it's like holding a pretty heavy dumbbell out at arm's length. You can't do it. And you certainly can't do it while you're trying to fight. So in reality, you often move. So even if you're ideally with the type of shield you're using wanting to hold it out here, you might find that a lot of the time you're holding it here uh, while you're fighting, but as the opponent starts to launch their attack, you might be bringing out the shield to meet the attack some of the time. So a lot of the time with larger, heavier shields, you're not, even if you want to hold them out, you're not, necessar not necessarily going to hold them out here all the time because you'd get too tired and your responses become, become slower. So very often, even if we look at uh, fencing treaties like um, I-33 or 133, also known as the Tower Effect book, the earliest fencing treaties we have from Europe, uh, while the buckler is often held out at length from the arm, it, when it's engaged with another person's uh, sword, for example, or buckler, it's not always held like that when you're just standing there. So often you will go into distance like this, and only when you come in to engage will you extend the sword and the, the buckler out to arm's length. 
So even with systems where this is used at arm's length, you don't usually hold it at arm's length all the time. However, some shields enable you to do that. And the most famous example is the buckler that we were just talking about. So in fact, with a buckler, it is light enough that you can hold it out at arm's length an awful lot. And if we look at the Bolognese traditions, again, the Bolognese sources, then we find that in Italian sword and buckler, the buckler is held out at arm's length an awful lot. And of course, this makes maximum use of the pro protective cone provided by what's really a relatively small shield. Clearly, this would not work well if we just held it here in front of the chest all the time, because all it would protect is approximately the area of the buckler. By holding it out, we now, as you can see towards the camera, this protects, if you just look at me here, protects that much area, and as I bring it out towards you, it protects a much, much larger area. So clearly, holding it further out provides more protection, and if you're using a small shield, that therefore becomes not only worthwhile doing to get the maximum protection, but you can do it for longer because it's a smaller, lighter shield. And this is also true of things like the uh, Indian Dal, or Persian, I uh, um, can't remember what Sephar is it? The, um, so the Indo-Persian shield. And you might, you might go, as I said before, you might go into combat at this distance, but as soon as you come in and engage, blam, the thing will probably often be coming out at this distance. Not to say they always did it like that. So I mentioned exceptions. And in fact, if we look at Gatka, if we look at Persian martial arts, often what you'll see is they often punch into an attack rather than holding it out. So whereas the Bolognese would hold the buckler out and fight around it, it seems that in certain Asian and Middle Eastern martial arts, they would actually attack and basically punch into incoming attacks as they come in. So they would be extending the arm out, but only at the moment of the opposing blade coming in and then they'd retract back again. Um, and if you look at Gatka, you often see it looks sort of looks like this. They're sort of going one, two, one, two. So uh, there are multiple ways of using bucklers. And even in Europe, as I say, there wasn't only one system of using the medieval and Renaissance buckler. There were, I won't say rival, but there were um, uh, sort of different schools and uh, with different sort of lineages, different ways of thinking, different ways of doing things. So just the same as there were different fencing styles, specifically there were also different sword and buckler styles and sword and shield styles. So speaking very simply, how do you hold the shield when we're talking about smaller shields? We've essentially got variations in range from the body and also sometimes specific variations in angle. So if someone's attacking down at your legs, you might lower the buckler down. If someone's attacking at your head, you might raise the buckler up. Same thing with a larger shield. Um, if we were fighting with sword and shield with a Viking Age shield, if someone's attacking high, you might put both your weapon and the shield high. If they're attacking low, you might do this. If you're opposing a spear, for example, you might bind over the top of the spear with the sword and have the shield low and come in with the point in the face, so on and so forth. Uh, and clearly, if you were being attacked by cavalry or something like that with a lance coming from high up, you might be having your shield much higher up. So generally speaking, difference in different uh, range from the body and difference in angulation of the arm. Now, something else to consider, whether it's a buckler or a larger sh flat shield like this, is angle. Okay. Now, generally speaking, I tend to hold at a slight angle like this, whereby things are sloping off to the outside there. But there is some... Uh, evidence of larger shields sometimes being held flat, um, flat forward like that. And in certain circumstances, you might even angle the shield inwards. If, for example, an attack is coming down the center line here, you might push inwards with the shield. And this is in shown, for example, in Talhofer with the dueling shield. You might push inwards in order to come around with an attack this side. So these shields can be angled anywhere from in, sorry, outside to inside. Um, or straight on, and sometimes, of course, angled upwards or downwards as well, relative to the weapon, uh, to where the opponent's weapon is um, in relation to the face of your shield. Now, interestingly, <coughs> that's basically true of bucklers as well, even curved bucklers. So they can be angled outside, inside, up or down, relative to the, where the opponent's weapon is and what you're doing. But with curved shields, it's somewhat interesting because with a curved shield, we actually cover more lines at the same time. Not only do you have a more deflective and stronger surface, but you're also able to sort of cover the front line and the side line at the same time with that curve. And even with earlier 
um, nightly shields, this is the case. So you can have the front edge occupying the centre line and then because of the curve, this curves all the way around to the outside, which makes it harder for someone to get around the back of your shield and get on the inside. So even when you're holding the shield quite frontally onwards, it's still covering the sideline and that would be true on this side uh, as well. And obviously a dome shield, a curved shield has that effect horizontally and a domed shield, convex shield, has that effect up and down as well as side to side. And it should be noted that the first curved uh, shields that really got popular in, uh, in medieval Europe um, <coughs> were convex shields used in the Frankish Empire, which are essentially like domed or convex versions of these. And then later, the more universal across Europe, I think, the curved um, teardrop shield, as exemplified by the Norman shield here. And of course, curved and convex shields were not at all an, a new thing. They go all the way back, in fact, far beyond the Romans. The Roman scutum is a curved shield, but of course the hoplite shield is a dome shield and really is the uh, precursor to the rotella that were popular in the Renaissance and almost certainly the rotella probably partly became popular in the Renaissance because of the classical, you know, the Renaissance, because of the classical rebirth and then trying to use things that looked like they were from the ancient world. And of course, hoplite shields were all over art and they wanted to copy those. So that was uh, <coughs> certainly part of it and it covers the outside lines and up and uh, up and over. But there are other types of shields as well. If we go all the way back to really early uh, Greek shields and certain types of Egyptian and other shields, there are other types of conical and curved structures that fulfill the same purpose. So something like the Roman scutum, for example, can easily cover two angles at the same time. Almost it's curved, curved enough to cover three angles at the same time because it prescribes quite a large part of the circumference of a circle. And this was also true with certain types of later pavis as well. Um, now, something else that's worth mentioning with these very large shields is that there isn't only one type of distance that you can, that you can hold them from the body. So, so far I've been looking at uh, shields like this that could be held here or out here or anywhere between there, okay? But we've also got to think about angle change as well because with a shield that is long and not round or square or kind of knightly shield shaped, you can also of course extend it that way. And we absolutely know from artwork that these shields and pavises as well were sometimes extended with the long part at the bottom. And this was used offensively and defensively. And this goes for the Norman teardrop shield as well. So while predominantly most people tend to use them uh, with the teardrop pointing downwards, either here or out here, depending on what they're doing, you can absolutely extend the teardrop out that way as well. And theoretically, you could use that, as, as I say, both offensively and defensively. So if someone's attacking, uh, stepping in and attacking with a sword cut, for example, I could, so long as there's no risk to my legs, I could reach my point of my shield out into their face there. And not only does that cover a really long line towards the side of my head and give me a nice opening to attack back, but of course it might hurt them because I'm, I'm jabbing out the point of my shield as they're moving forwards right into their face and of course blocking their sword arm, assuming they're right-handed. So the final thing I want to say about how to hold a shield is it also relates to the type of shield. Now I've touched on that already with the buckler whereby if it is light and if it is small, it is generally advantageous to hold it out at arm's length because that's how it gives the most protection, protects the greatest area of your body. And also it's small enough and light enough that you can do that, do that for long amounts of time. With a larger, heavier shield, you can't usually do that. However, it's larger. <laughs> and because it's larger, it's very important to say, because it's larger, you don't necessarily need to. Because if we look at the Norman shield, if we go as far back as I can in this shot, the Norman shield clearly covers all the way down from my middle of my shin all the way up to the middle of my face. So it is already even holding it close to my body, protecting an awful lot of my body. Now, if you think about battlefield formations, fighting in large formations like the uh, like medieval armies did or like the Romans did, having a shield that you can hold close to your body and it still protects a lot of your body without the need to hold it out at arm's length is quite advantageous uh, because of course you don't have the tiresomeness of having to extend out to defend here. You're not tiring out your shoulder by holding your shield out at a uh, long distance for a long time. You can anchor it in here. It still protects a good area of your body but it's kept close to you. 
Um, so when you come to look at video games or artwork even, even people are doing artwork in historical books, which unfortunately isn't always that historically accurate. The fact is some historical artwork in history books is absolutely amazing, like Graham Turner, and other people's is not so good. Some of it's flat out rubbish. Um, so don't always trust what you see in artwork in history books. But the fact is that when you're looking, whether it's a video game or a history book, when you're looking at how someone's holding a shield, think of what are they doing in that moment? Do they have multiple attackers? Are they facing uh, missiles which are coming down from above? Obviously, those are the kind of clear and obvious things. But also think about if they're in close combat, what type of shield is it and what type of close combat is it? So quite simply, if you see someone with a large shield like this holding it close to their body, that's absolutely fine because it's a long shield. It protects all of their body, protects all the way down to the leg well. And you will notice um, that they might extend the arm out to protect the sword hand because one of the dangers of keeping a shield close to your body and is when you go to hit, your arm is now extended beyond fully exposed, fully vulnerable. Whereas if we just extend the shield out just a little bit to there, we're now protecting the line to the sword hand. So in other words, it might be here when you're ready to strike, but as you strike, it might come out to there. Okay, and that corresponds to sword and buckler fencing as well. Um, so what are they doing in that moment and where is their shield at that moment? If they're just doing this, that's probably not great, even though it is shown in medieval artwork, and I'm sure people did it. If they're showing this, that's probably really quite well thought, thought out. If they're holding something like a buckler, they absolutely shouldn't be doing this, okay? They should be doing something more that looks like that. However, if they're preparing to strike, then indeed the buckler might be back here and it might only come out as they strike. Anyway, I hope that's given you some things to think about. So, uh, and you know, what type of shield it is. There's not always only one correct way to do it, but there are definitely some wrong ways to do it. What type of shield it is, what period it is, how it's gripped, whether it's boss gripped or strapped, will affect where it is on the arm. There are certain shields like hoplite shields, which are almost kind of like a bit of both because the hoplite shield is, you do have a sort of, sort of um, strip, I suppose, rather than the strap that your arm goes through and then you grip it at the edge. So the hoplite shield is a bit of an odd one, but most other shields are either purely boss gripped or a strap. So what angles they're held at, whether they're up or down, uh, what extension they're held at and what the person's doing in the moment. I hope that's been useful to give you some thoughts if you're an artist or if you're writing, um, you know, historical fiction or fantasy or whatever, maybe this will be useful for you. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope I see you back on the channel really soon. I have been Matt Easton and I will be again next time. Cheers folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.